Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa, West Alabama. Internet world right here in downtown North Port, a mile or two away from Bryant Denny Stadium. This is the Joe Gaither Show right here on Bama Central, BamaCentral.com. You're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, watch on, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Of course, right there at BamaCentral.com. You can follow me, of course, at Joe Gaither 6 on all the social media machines. We're going to have a fun home day edition today. We're going to go down to Baton Rouge and welcome on Matt Moscana from ESPN 104.5. He's going to join us to talk about the Tigers. We talked to Jacob Pickle yesterday to talk Alabama, Alabama basketball, but we are very, very uh, grateful to have Matt Moscana join us from Baton Rouge. He hosts After Further Review on ESPN 104.5. Matt, how are you doing today? Thank you for your time. Hey, Joe, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's going to be a huge week. Alabama and LSU, uh, last night's playoff rankings coming out. LSU at 14 and Alabama still at eight. So it's going to be a huge, huge week for both teams. Uh, what's this roll off with, uh, with with a big picture question? Everybody saw uh, everybody saw LSU lose to Florida State 45 to 24. How has LSU changed or grown since that opening week loss? Well, I think... Um, the biggest change would probably be defensively. And I'm not even sure it came after that loss. You know, the defensive issues I think were, uh, were exposed in that game and, um, and were perpetuated against, uh, that, that three game stretch with Arkansas, Ole Miss and Missouri. Right. Um, and the biggest changes that LSU's made, that'll be noticeable this weekend. They've gone to a, a true four man defensive front. Look, Joe, LSU's defense is um, they're they're not good. Yeah. Um, but the two changes they've made that that have helped steady them, the the best defensive unit is their defensive line, and so going to a true four man front has sort of accentuated that line, which is a good thing. The other is they found a home for Harold Perkins. They they spent all he had such a great freshman year, and then Harold wanted to to move to. A, an off-ball linebacker. He wanted to play inside. Think Devin White instead of just the pass rush specialist. So they spent all offseason, um, spring, fall camp, everything, trying to make him into an inside backer, and that's just not what he's going to be. So um, they've committed to him being this in this nickel Sam role, and and instead of him having to learn new responsibilities every week, he knows where his home in is. It's allowed him to play a lot faster. So you've seen, as a result, Harold Perkins' production really ramp up as well. So you know, those two things have have helped make this defense better. But they're still not a defense that you're going to look at and go, oh, that that's an LSU defense. And, and I don't think that's how it's going to look Saturday either. I, I think this is a defense that's still going to give up yards and points. Well, LSU six and two. They 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 boast number one uh, offense in the nation, number one really quarterback in the country, Jaden Daniels. Do you think? Uh, what, what what do you make of Jaden Daniels? Really, he's tra- transferred from Arizona State last year. Was a pretty good year. This year, yeah. he's just been unstoppable. Will he win the Heisman Trophy? He's. I mean, I would vote for him. If well, Heisman tro- look, we learned in 2015. Um, if you try to inscribe someone's name on the Heisman in October, that's that's a fool's errand. Uh, I mean. Leonard Fournette had the thing sewn up in October in 2015, and then they went to Tuscaloosa, and he he ran like 15 times for 30 yards, and uh, well, the rest of the season didn't go so hot. So right. that that awards won and lost in November. If Jaden Daniels continues at the pace he has, and LSU wins in Tuscaloosa, and then they beat Florida, Georgia State, and Texas A&M, then Jaden Daniels will win the Heisman Trophy. I, I don't know that LSU is going to win out, but Joe, I don't think it's going to be because Jaden Daniels doesn't play well. I, I think Daniels is going to continue doing what he what he does. It's it, it's not a fluke or by happenstance. He's spectacular. And if if we hadn't known Joe Burrow, um, Jaden Daniels would be putting up the single greatest season ever in LSU football history. Uh, but to be second only to Joe Burrow is still. Um, it's a hell of a badge there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Brian Kelly's in, in his second year at, at LSU. How has he been received? Obviously, last year winning the SEC West, well, what a big mark that, that is for, for him as a first-year head coach. Uh, and then how, more specifically, how did the Alabama win last year really endear him to uh, endear him to, to Baton Rouge? Oh, it's huge. I mean, th- think if 
Think about that two point conversion. Obviously, converting in overtime, beating Alabama year one, and ultimately that that's how you won the West. That's sort of been the the hallmark. If if that pass is incomplete or Mason Taylor short, LSU is a four loss team and they don't go to Atlanta. It's just a vastly it's just a vastly different overview of, of Brian Kelly's tenure so far. So, it, I mean, it, I'm not going on a limb saying it. I mean, that that is the cornerstone win he's had so far. Of course. And it was just – it was – it's hard to overstate the importance of getting that win, especially because LSU had that long losing streak in the series, had the eight straight losses, and um, you, you got over the hump in the Burrow year, and then you, you, then you backslid as a program – and in year one for Kelly to come in and get that done, I, I think really planted a flag in the minds of many that that um, this isn't going to be as one sided as it was for that long stretch. Tell us about Emory Jones Jr. He missed the Army game, uh, kind of went out at the in the middle of the Auburn game. How is his health, and will he be at full strength this weekend? In yeah, yeah. Um, Brian Kelly told us on Monday, uh, Emory Jones practiced last week during the bye and he's he's a full go so that's that's the good news on the injury front for LSU and it not that an injury ever is a good thing but if you were going to have one at the right time it, you know your starting right tackle who's a who's a, a freak show and a you know future NFL potential first round type guy you know to have that at the beginning of the Army game or excuse me, the beginning of the Auburn game came at a really good time because it allowed you basically 21 days from injury to Alabama for Emory to get right. And it also allows you the opportunity to get your backup, you know, Lance Hurd, who's a five-star, the highest rated signing in this class. It really got Lance Hurd two full games. He played the full Auburn game and then started and played the whole game against Army. So you got some valuable reps for the backup as well. But, but yeah, but Emory's, Emory's a full go. He'll be out there um, starting on Saturday. We're joined by Matt Mascana of ESPN 104.5 in Baton Rouge. You can follow him at Matt Mascana on the Twitter machine. Okay, so Nick Saban on his Monday press conference, he named pretty much every LSU skill position player uh, that, that, that they have. And really, he hasn't done that in any of Monday press conference so far. He usually sticks to a quarterback and compliments the team, the coach. Malik Neighbors, obviously great, great receiver. Well, Alabama boasts two pretty good little corner, cornerbacks in Kool-Aid McKinstry and Terry and Arnold. If Kool-Aid or Terry takes him away, if that becomes a wash matchup, what's next for Jaden Daniels? Do you expect him to be uh, right to the tight end, or do you expect so, someone else, uh, Ky- Ky- Kyron, uh, Kyron Williams, Kyron uh, Lacey, Kyron Lacey, excuse me, Kyron Lacey, to uh, step up and fill that? But who's going to be the next option for uh, for for, for Jaden Daniels? So I have a ton of respect for Kool-Aid McKinstry. I got to talk to him at SC Media Days. I love the Kool-Aid uh, chain that he had on the Kool-Aid yes, man. Yes, awesome. Great character. Um, uh, but you're not taking away Malik Neighbors. Um, okay. He's – and if – even if you try to bracket Malik, the guy that you didn't mention is Brian Thomas Jr., who leads the nation in touchdown receptions. So teams that try to take away Malik He's have 11. Left yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Thomas in one-on-one coverage, and he leads the nation in touchdown catches. So both of those guys are – they're stars, man. Uh, there aren't many teams that that have one, let alone two of those guys. Kyron is the number three who you mentioned, and we could go on and on down the list. At, at LSU has never been lacking for receiver talent. In the program's history, they've lacked the quarterback to throw the ball to the receivers – um, I mean, this place was a quarterback graveyard for 10 years, but, um, no, man, they're, um, they're, they're set at receiver at this look, Joe, this, this offense, um, insane. I, there just isn't a weakness, man. The offensive line is, is veteran and talented. You got a quarterback playing as good as anyone in the country. You're loaded at receiver. You have a legit NFL running back in Logan Diggs. Mason Taylor is a, is maybe the best, but outside of Brock Bowers, maybe the best tight end in the SEC. There, there's a reason they're the number one offense in the country, man. There just there isn't a weakness there. So, look, I, I got all the respect in the world for Nick Saban. Alabama always has great players, but LSU is going to move the ball and score. It, yeah. the, the game isn't going to be determined on that side. The, the game is going to be determined on if if the LSU defense can find any kind of way to get stops. And if they can't, it's it's going to be one of those games like we saw LSU play against Ole Miss or Arkansas or 
or Missouri where it's just both teams up and down the field and it's going to be a four quarter game where, you know, who, who makes the play in the fourth quarter, who gets the big stop or turnover, um, which honestly, Joe, that's, that's the kind of game I'm expecting Saturday. I think you're exactly right. I've been watching a lot of LSU this past week. And uh, really I got a little bit of heat from my side of people saying that Logan Diggs, I think might be the best running back that Alabama's faced this year. Many people said, Oh, the Texas running back and the Tennessee back and, uh, and, and, and Quinchon Judkins from Ole Miss. What's your take on that? I, mean, I think Logan Diggs, I, I couldn't decide if Logan Diggs was really the best running back that Alabama's faced, or was it the offense that opened things up because you have so many different weapons happens to, uh, to, 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 to account for that really let Logan Diggs find m- m- much more space. So I love Quinchon Judkins. Yeah. Um, you know, 1,400 yards as a freshman in this league is, I mean, that's a, that's a mouthful. But Judkins really struggled the first half of the season. Yeah. Um, as that Ole Miss offense was trying to find itself, and certainly that offensive line. Um, pure talent, like if you're looking at projectability to the next level, I mean, I, I'd take a guy like Judkins over Logan Diggs. But Logan Diggs is an NFL running back. I mean, just by just by contrast, when you look at LSU a year ago and now, I mean, Josh Williams was LSU's leading rusher among running backs. Jaden Daniels led the team in rushing a year ago, but Josh Williams was the leading running back. Josh Williams is a former walk-on. And, he, and look, he's turned himself into – credit that kid. He's turned himself into a really nice college football player. But you watch the two running styles – and it's just there's a very noticeable difference. Logan Diggs is a guy, he's a Sunday guy. Um, you know, he, he'll be a thousand yard rusher and he can catch the ball out of the backfield and he can pick up blitzes and he's he's in he's in every down back. So, you know, the way you phrased it, I, I mean, if I'm looking who's the most talented, I, I still think Quinshaw Judkins is the most talented running back in the SEC. So I would take Judkins over Diggs. But that's not to disrespect Logan Diggs, who I, I think is a Sunday player and has has really helped transform LSU's running game. Because last year, so much of the running game was there's pressure on Jaden. Run, <laughs> take yeah. take off, Jaden. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he still has that element, but but they can line up and run behind a big physical offensive line, and Logan Diggs can get tough yards. So he's a he's a really good player. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a. a really a huge challenge really defending i mean there's just so many different weapons and the versatility and, and really watching uh the auburn game the offensive coordinator was, was was just spreading the ball all over the place and so a lot of that is Jaden daniels as well so it's going to be a huge challenge uh you mentioned the game's going to be on the other side of the ball so let's flip to the other side of the ball lsu uh, LSU with massive kind of problems with the secondary. Zion Alexander is going to be going to be out. Obviously, you've had Denver Harris and uh, the, some of the other transfers are kind of suspended slash off the team. What's going to be? What's the secondary outlook? Uh, Sage Ryan moved to cornerback. Uh, he played safeties. Played a lot of cornerback. What's going to be the outlook in the secondary for LSU? Not good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know it's. It's, it's a shame for this team because you have such a prolific offense. You have, you have an offense capable of winning a national championship. Oh, yes. And your defense is nowhere near holding up their end of the bargain. Um, look, LSU rightfully earned that moniker DBU for a lot of years. And everybody knows that. You don't need me to rattle off the names. Everybody knows them. Those guys are not in the secondary. There, there's, there's nobody in the secondary that you would look at and say, Yep, that guy's a first-round pick, or that guy's even going to be drafted. Like, I, I literally don't think there's anybody playing in LSU secondary that is a draftable player, which is a I, that's just a foreign thought for LSU. Um, the Zy Alexander injury is significant because he, and that's a, a transfer from southeastern Louisiana, so an, an FCS transfer has been your best cornerback at LSU. The program that produced Patrick Peterson and Mo Claiborne and Derek Stingley and Trey White and Tyron Matthew and the best guy is a southeastern Louisiana transfer. That's that's a problem. Um, so Zai's been your best guy, and he's he's out. He, he's probably done for the year. But honestly, Joe, the there's a big difference if like if you're going from Derek Stingley to a freshman, that's a big gap, sure. right? That's a really big drop off. If you go from Zy Alexander to a freshman, I don't know that there's that much of a difference. Okay. I, I, this, they're LSU is going to play a lot of zone because they have to, and they're going to they're going to say Jalen Milrow, can you go 
21 of 26 today and and dink and dunk and pick us apart and we'll give you the underneath completion and try to tackle the problem is lsu doesn't always tackle and when you're playing zone you have to be where you're supposed to be and they're not always where they're supposed to be and that's how you give up 700 yards to Ole miss um and that's going to be there for alabama if if they're able to take advantage of it uh we'll see if they can and i don't think bama's asked milro to do that this year um but he's certainly he's a talented enough guy to do it and bama's got the receiving talent to do it i mean those top two guys are really good so i my confidence level in lsu going to tuscaloosa and holding bama under 30 is almost zero i think bama's going to score 30 points in this game or more but i think lsu will as well my biggest concern is Alabama's consistency on offense. I mean, I see the holes or the problems that LSU's had on defense, but it's just can Alabama come out right off the, right off the bat and, and play consistent offense? It's going to be – that's going to be my biggest question right yeah. there. Arkansas, who is in some categories statistically the worst offense in the SEC, came into Baton Rouge and put up 400 yards and 30 – it was a month ago, 430 – was the 31 game. 31 points 34 400 31. yards and 31 points bro yeah. alabama is going to score in this game yeah. trust me alabama's gonna score they're gonna score a lot the question is can lsu score more um what? and i think and they'll have they have the offense to do it uh, they'll have to play just about perfect offensively you talk about moving uh changing into defensive fronts makai wingo also going to be out for the next six or so weeks for lsu mason smith really becomes that name on the defensive line what else uh will mason smith have some buddies that will help him out what's the defensive line out because alabama struggled protecting the passer now some of that's on milro holding the ball a little too long but some of that's been on protection issues communication issues and maybe a little bit of a skill set issue on the left side <laughs> yeah, it's it's stunning to watch um, you know, there's only four teams in the country that have allowed more sacks than Alabama, right. which is stunning. I mean, just all when you think about all of the talent that Nick's recruited on both lines of, the, of scrimmage over the last 15 years, it's it's so surprising to see that issue. It's it's similar to the issue LSU's having in the secondary, where you're so accustomed to seeing so much NFL talent, you know, in that position group. Um, so you asked about Makai Wingo. He um, Makai's been playing hurt all year, and um, and as a result, he he hasn't at any point this year really looked like the guy he was a year ago. And credit him playing through an injury and trying to gut it out, but decided to go ahead and have surgery, and and it's going to shut him down for six weeks. Um, LSU last year rotated three defensive tackles. Like, think about that for a second. Three. Makai Wingo played almost ninety nine percent of LSU's defensive snaps. He never came off the field. So Brian Kelly knew he had to go in the transfer portal and recruit a bunch of defensive tackles, and they did. Um, and the guy that's actually graded out the best at that position this year is a kid from West Virginia named Jordan Jefferson. And you'll see him. He wears 99. Um, he is a really – he's one of those really, like, strong bull rush kids on the interior. So he'll get the start next to Mason Smith. Uh, Jacoby and Guillory's a four-year player. He's 340 pounds. He's a big space he's eater in the middle. He'll rotate in. And they'll give you a lot of different odd looks as well. Paris Shand was an Arizona transfer. Jalen Lee's kid from the Baton Rouge area who went to Florida transferred home. So they got numbers, and they'll rotate him in, and they're good there. They've got, they've got good talent. And I, I do think that LSU's defensive front is going to give that Alabama offensive line some problems. But, you know, we know how Alabama, and it's a big credit to Tommy Reese, as they've evolved offensively this year, the perception is Jalen Milrow is a runner, and he hasn't been over the last month. It's it's the traditional running game with McClellan and Williams, and then Milrow's looking for that play play action shot over the top. And you know, I think LSU is going to be able to pressure Milrow. I think they're going to be able to limit the run, um, but I I don't think they're going to be able to completely limit those big plays in the passing game, which which is where the problem is really going to come in for LSU. Well, let's talk about something that just happened uh, on the SEC coaches teleconference. I don't know if you were able to hear that, but both Brian Kelly and Nick Saban talking about the LSU Alabama rivalry. Uh, we only got a couple more minutes left here with Matt Miscana, the LSU Alabama rivalry. Uh, look, the schedules are going to change here pretty soon. The Alabama and LSU still on each other's 2024 schedules. We'll be down in Baton Rouge here in, uh, this time next year. 
But what's the the likelihood that this becomes one of the protected games? I mean, it's been the marquee game of the SEC the last 10 years at least. Uh, what's the likelihood that the, this rivalry gets kind of protected? Uh, and what do you make of uh, it might not, might not be an every year thing? So my thought initially, whenever we knew Texas and OU were coming into the league and they were going to stick with the scheduling format, I thought this game annually was not going to be protected because you know Alabama is going to play Auburn and going to play Tennessee every year. And so I thought the LSU game would be the one that would that would go away as far as the annual matchup. But what was interesting is the way that the SEC sort of split the league in half was, okay, well, you have the, the top half of the league and the bottom half of the league, and the top half will you know will play more games against the top, and the bottom will get an extra game against the bottom. And much to Nick Saban's chagrin, Tennessee over the last decade has been in the bottom, but they certainly aren't in the bottom right now. Um, so I, I don't know how this is all going to play itself out. Uh, I, I thought we would have been at nine games already. I think if there's an there is an eventuality to this that we will get to a nine game conference schedule, which makes playing a game like this easier. But the other thing too, Joe, is look, man, so much of the revenue in this conference is tied up with your TV partners. And when you have a property like LSU Alabama, which as you mentioned, has been like the marquee game in the league. Well, I mean, every like LSU hasn't always held up its end of the bargain, but. Really, if you go back to 2007, 2008, I mean, this has been the game in the conference with with some exceptions. Um, it's hard to imagine them not playing it if if what you're doing is catering to your to your TV partners. All right, last question for me. We've been talking to Matt Mascana, ESPN 104.5, after further review down in Baton Rouge. All right, give us the LSU feel. You've kind of outlined everything that you feel so far, but what is the fan base? How do the fan base, how do they feel coming to Tuscaloosa this weekend? And wrap us up if you're ready for it. If you're not, it's okay with, with final thoughts, but wrap us up with your uh, with your prediction for the ball game. The fan base, man. The fan base thinks else is going there to win by 30, bro. All right. Good. That's what we want to hear. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> if you want to you want a fan's confidence. perspective, uh, fans are always supremely confident. They sure, sure, be. sure. You got um, people on in our radio circles. Oh, we're not going to be able to hold them. They're going to score 60. It's going to be 60 to 30. So a lot of Alabama fans are feeling I, nervous. I don't think it's going to be 60 to 30. Um, I mean, I look, look, I, um, I haven't made a, a pick on the game yet. If I like, sure. I always think of it like this, Joe. Yeah. If I had to take everything I own and go bet a game, right? My entire net worth, um, I would I would pick Alabama. Being at home, uh, I think there's a reason they're favored. LSU's defense has not been good, and going on the road against Alabama and Nick Saban with that defense is just an unenviable task. I do think there's a path for LSU to win it. Um, but it's what I described. I, I think if you go back and look at that, look, the first game that LSU and Bama played when Nick was back at Tuscaloosa back in 07, I think that one finished 41 37, something like that. That's LSU's path. If this gets to a game where, you know, if you average out 10 possessions for each team, if LSU can get two stops a half and maybe hold Bama to four touchdowns and two field goals, you're looking at 34 points for Bama. Can LSU best them by one score? That's that's their path. Can LSU win a a 38-34 game, a 41-37 type game? Yes. If Alabama is able to hold L, like if LSU commits turnovers, penalties are a problem. Um, look, the here, a great example is the Florida State game. You know, LSU led that game. People forget LSU put up 400 yards in that game and led it half, but they had two possessions inside the 10 where they came away with no points. Where LSU went forward on fourth downs, came away with no points. If you convert in those situations, LSU is up 17 at half, and that Florida State game is dramatically different, They, but they didn't. So can you convert sevens in the red zone? Can you avoid the turnovers? If LSU does that and is offensively what they've been all year, they're going to have a good chance to have a, a possession late in the fourth quarter to go win the game. Uh, if they turn the ball over and they don't convert in the red zone, then it's just it's going to be a, another long day with a, with a bad defense. So – I'm hoping it's a great game, man. I'm, I'm hoping we see that four-quarter game. And, and usually, uh, even though Bama had that long win streak, the game still delivered a lot of those years where there were close oh, games. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping we get a, a really good game on, on Saturday in Tuscaloosa again. 
Will you make your way up to uh, Tuscaloosa? No, man. I'll be doing a post game show on site here in Baton Rouge. So they're they're chaining me to the desk to work. But um, you know, I will say this: as as much animosity as there is and and intensity in this rivalry, I've been to I've been to Tuscaloosa plenty of times, and uh, I've always been treated really good there, man. As both as a media member and as a fan. So. I think um, that's one of the great places to watch college football. And uh, like, I'll tell you, I wouldn't say that about everywhere. Like Arkansas is the armpit of the league. I, I dread going there every time I have to go. I've, I've never had a good experience there. Uh, Florida, I think is a miserable experience as a road fan. Um, Bama, I think South Carolina, Kentucky are all, all have been great places. Texas A&M have been great places to go as a visitor. So um, I hope all the LSU fans that make their way there do have a good experience in Tuscaloosa on, uh, on, on Saturday. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time. I know you got a very busy day. We all have busy weeks. It's a big week right around here, Alabama and LSU week. You, you can hear Matt Muscana, ESPN 104.5, after further review from 3 until 6 Central Time. Thank you for your time, sir. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay, Joe. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's Matt Muscata joining us on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central, giving us a lot of insight. Ooh, no, not going to take away Malik Neighbors, Kool-Aid McKinstry, not going to erase any of those receivers. Oh, my gosh. Makes me very, very nervous as we continue to watch LSU tape. I very, very much appreciate Matt Muscana joining us today. Make sure you shoot him a follow at Matt Muscana on the Twitter machine and listen to him. If you're in the Baton Rouge area, what a 4.5 on the uh, on the uh, radio dial. Host of After Further Review. Great insight. Uh, great expertise on LSU. So, uh, well, that's going to do it, really. We're going to have a short show today. We're going to have a short show today just because we had Matt Muscano. We're going to try to get another guest on the program tomorrow on Thursday. Then we're going to have Football Friday on Friday with all the Bama Central crew. Uh, so, it's going to be a blast rest of the week. We're going to take you uh, right up until kickoff, I'll be inside Brian Denny Stadium. I was thinking about it. He was talking about the LSU uh, 2015 game, Leonard Fournette. I was up there with my ex-wife in the top rafter, uh, in the top deck of Brian Denny Stadium, and really just giving it. I was still a, I was still a student at that point. I was giving it to Leonard Fournette that night, yelling uh, in Brian Denny Stadium. And, and look, the the, the crowd, the the the, 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 the team's going to need you to have that same sort of energy, that same sort of angry energy. Alabama had something to prove against Leonard Fournette that night, and Alabama needs to kind of take on that something to prove attitude against Jaden Daniels and this number one offense in the nation. So you're going to have to, uh, if you're if you're planning on being in the stadium, look, you're going to have to bring it. You're going to have to be, you know, not to use the Texas A&M phrase, but to use the Texas A&M phrase, you're going to have to be that 12th man on defense. Yeah, Alabama forced, what, two, fourth, uh, two, two false starts late in the game against Tennessee, but that was late in the game. Bring the energy right from the jump. Even if it doesn't go well, even if LSU scores, they're going to score. Matt Muscana just told us he thinks they're going to score. Uh, if, you know, they're going to score at a high clip. You're going to have to be in it. You're going to have to play your part of the play. Uh, you're going to have to play your part of the play to, 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 to affect the LSU offense as best you can. Brian Kelly in year number two would like nothing more than to beat Alabama a second year in a row. And if they beat Alabama, boom, that makes you a three-way tie, LSU, Alabama, and Ole Miss in the SEC West. And, yeah, Alabama has felt like it's been in total control in the SEC. But, uh Oh, gosh, you drop into a three-way tie with just a couple of games left. Kentucky on all uh, Kentucky and Auburn. Anything can happen. You don't want to go down to down on the plains. You don't want to go down to Jordan Hare Stadium in the in the middle of a three-way tie against uh LSU and Ole Miss. Goodness gracious. No, sir. And, and I know Ole Miss still has to go play Georgia. And uh, and that's gonna be that's gonna be a very tall task for Lane Giffen, but you don't want to have a three-way tie. All right, so uh, actually I, I said that's gonna be the end of the program, but no, let's let's stick to one more topic. Let's stick to one more topic as there was big news last night. The college football playoff committee rankings were released their first. Uh, their first rankings of the new year. And you had what? You had L uh, Ohio State, Georgia, Michigan, Florida State, Washington, Oregon, Texas, and then number eight, Alabama. Uh, well, the first couple of things that we that we made of this list was very happy to see Ole Miss at 
10 uh, because that gives that, that gives Alabama a good strength of schedule boost. And, you know, you're happy to see LSU at 14 as well. Uh, and then, look, you got Tennessee was at 17. That pretty much rounds out your SEC. Uh, well, Missouri, don't want to skip Missouri. Missouri at 12 as well. They're part of the conference too, Joe. But ah, what would you make of the SEC, uh, of the rankings? I was – Happy that the, that, the, that the committee ranked Ohio State number one. I do think that they have the best resume in the in, in the country right now. I know a lot of people think that that might be biased towards Ohio State, but they beat Notre Dame. They beat Penn State, two top ten teams at the time. Now, that's the problem. The problem is you got rankings. Oh, gosh. You shouldn't rank the AP poll is should be useless. AP poll, college for uh, AP poll and, and coaches poll should be thrown out the door, and you shouldn't even have them. But the Associated Press needs to have a poll, so uh, so basically they get their rocks off polling their voters, and there's their vote. And the coaches poll, look, they give it to their most of them give it to their SIDs, and they cast the votes and basically say, "Don't embarrass me with with, with, with your vote." I don't really – look, all this is going to shake out. All this is going to shake out. you got, what, five weeks left in the season, four or five weeks left in the season. Obviously, November 1st today. Thank you. Uh, we have turned the calendar into November. And if you are in the West Alabama area, it is quite chilly today. I love that. I love that. Put on an extra jacket. Uh, but you feel like fall weather. Uh, so, look. It's all going to shake out. Georgia fans who are upset that they're number two, uh, they know that it's all going to shake out. Michigan and Ohio State still have to play one another. Washington, uh, Washington already beat Oregon. You might see a rematch in that uh, in the, in a Pac-12 title game. Texas still has some some, uh, some decent games left, and they're probably going to end up playing a rematch with Oklahoma as well. Oklahoma and Texas sandwiching Alabama at seven and not seven, uh, rank number seven and rank number nine. Ah, I feel a little nervous about Alabama's chances at number eight. The biggest issue for Alabama is jumping all those teams. Florida State probably not going to lose again unless something weird happens. Michigan and Ohio State, like I said, one of them will knock the other out, likely will knock the other to number five or number six. It just depends on if they will knock them all the way to five or six. Texas being right in front of you is concerning. If Texas wins out and wins the Big uh, wins the Big 12, they're on a path to go higher. They're on a path to continue to go up. Really, Alabama's path is to still win. Win, win, win is the only path for Alabama. And I still think, I've said it already on this program probably two or three times, that Alabama needs Georgia to continue to win and stay undefeated so Alabama can play an undefeated Georgia in the SEC championship game. And honestly, I hope that that becomes a de facto playoff game. I hope that if Alabama wins, Georgia is out, Alabama is in. Uh, look, I, I saw a lot of talk last night on the ESPN where, oh, if Georgia goes undefeated and loses in the SEC championship game, they'll still be in at four. Look, I don't know. I don't know that I agree with that. I think that you really need to make that SEC championship game a playoff game. Uh, so we'll have to see how the rest. I mean, look, lots and lots of football left to go. Michigan still has to play Penn State and Ohio State. You're going to have uh, Washington still has USC and a couple other bit, uh, harder, tougher Pac-12 games. Alabama, biggest task is right there in front of you. You play LSU this weekend, the three-point favorite. You all heard from Matt Muscata. He thinks it's going to be uh, a good, close game, or it could go, you know, a good, a good close game if Alabama's – Oh, if Alabama's offense can play and score against the LSU defense, it's going to be a lot of fun on Saturday night. So join us at Bama Central on Saturday night. It's going to be 645 inside Bryant Denny Stadium. We'll have Katie Windham, Austin Hannon, and myself, uh, along with several others of the Bama Central crew. You can follow us on Twitter at Bama Central. Follow us on Facebook at Alabama uh, Crimson Tide on, at Sports Illustrated. Follow us on Instagram at Bama Central SI. You can follow me at Joe Gaither 6 on all the social media machines. Send me your comments, your questions, your queries, and complaints. We'll take them all right there at Joe Gaither 6. We appreciate all the fan interaction. Like, rate, review, subscribe to the show and on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon. Watch it on YouTube. Subscribe there if you'd like at Joe Gaither 6 or at Bama Central on the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, find us 
us on Facebook and Twitter. You can see us live there every day as well. So, look, I love you guys so much. It's going to be a fun rest of the day. Hope you're making it through your hump day. We're going to get out of here for the day. Hopefully, you're going to bring on another guest tomorrow uh, to help us preview this Alabama LSU game. And then we will have Football Friday, of course, on Friday, <laughs> on Friday. So we'll get out of here for the day. Hope you all have a great day. Follow us at Balance Central. All sorts of Bama coverage. 5 p.m. tonight, uh, 6 p.m. tonight. 6 p.m. tonight, we'll be in the Naylor Stone Media Room. We're listening to Nick Saban's final press conference ahead of this game, and we'll see if we can't ask him how his birthday was, how the health of the team is doing, how the ex- execution is doing, uh, and really just uh, his final thoughts on this ball game. So hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Tune in tomorrow for another edition of the Joe Gaither Show. Thank you.